Okay, let's react and transform World War I oversimplified part two into World War I, just right. Okay, now that's too much. Please stop talking. What we're going to do on this, we need to uh, add some essential vocabularies. There's some essential vocabulary that's not in, that should be in. Remove some unessential information that uh, you won't need for a course. Add some additional depth in what I find interesting, and we're going to make some across-time connections, okay? Uh, we're going to take some of the ideas and say, wow, that idea is important, that idea has moved across time and still affected people going into World War II or still affects people today. So first thing we got to do, attach some Velcro to a cat, stick the cat, and we're off. With both sides stuck in a hard stalemate, they knew this war wasn't going to be about taking territory, but about simply wearing each other down. The Allies had plenty of men to expend from its overseas dominions, and the British also started a naval blockade, so Germany couldn't import stuff like food. Okay, I want to take a second to uh, talk about resources and the importance of resources in any long endeavor for a country, but most importantly during conflict, because the need for resources grows. Not only do you need all your normal resources, but you need your resources uh, an extra amount for uh, the war. And World War I and World War II were long and relied on resources the longer uh, a conflict goes. And uh, you, get a sort of, uh, you get a sort of pattern. If the initial attack is withstood, the sprint of a war turns into an endurance race. And in that case, it favors the countries with resources. So in both world wars, um, or any conflict, Russia, whether it be the Soviet USSR or just the non-Soviet Russia or the United States would be favored. The United States has one of the larger populations in the world and the natural resources and the factories and the industrialization to be able to go to what they call a war footing and start producing both food and industrial goods. Russia typically relies upon people. Russia um, more that, oh, I want to say more than double the population of any other European country. So whichever conflict Russia is in, they have the people for a long sustained conflict. So we get to the idea of limiting resources. In a war, you get blockades, right? Um, and it seems pretty, no one's arguing, blockades of military goods, it seems common sense. If you're at war with a, another country, for really whatever reason, whether you're the aggressor, whether you've been attacked, whether it's a, a, a war to settle a problem, or if it's a war of takeover, like all the different t reasons for war, it seems like if you stop the enemy from getting weapons, the military goods, weapons and bullets and tanks, uh, eventually, if you stop the enemy from getting military goods, it doesn't seem like that's really a problem. It seems like it's better to keep weapons out of their hands than to have to kill them when they have weapons. It seems like a, a general good. Um, but the pro but when countries start blockading food, like in World War One, and there was a blockade on the Germans' food and, and civilian supplies of clothes and stuff, that seems a little more pro problematic. So what we get is uh, an example of 400,000 German civilians uh, one estimate died because of the food blockade and who's that who's going to die the elderly and the and the young young kids okay so that seems and, and indeed it is a violation of rules of war okay it's a violation of rules of war and it just doesn't it seems pretty problematic doesn't seem very nice the counter argument used is that a country like england would say well you're going to use uh, or england would say well you could just surrender you don't have enough food, you shouldn't be fighting a war. Surrender. It's your fault your people are starving to death. It's your fault your kids are starving because you won't surrender. Don't do a war if you don't have the supplies. I mean, that's an argument. Germany could have surrendered at any time. It's an argument. And this was uh, World War I, so they wouldn't have been taken over, perhaps. We'll see. Uh, another counter argument is that food and supplies is used for war. So the food that's getting into Germany is going to be, turn, and, and Germany used this exact argument too, the food that got to France is going to be used to feed soldiers, and the soldiers are going to go and kill Germans. So the in World War I, England and Germany really expanded the definition of war materials and war resources to include food and cloth and all that, because they said it would be used for war. Today we have these during peacetime, it's called sanctions and trade embargoes. It is an entirely powerful diplomatic tool. If one country is doing something you don't like, you put what's called a trade embargo or a sanctions on them. Uh, two recent ones, 
uh, the United States has put uh, sanctions and trade uh, restrictions on North Korea to try to get the North Korean rulers to change their behavior and sanctions and trade restrictions on Iran because Iran is doing nuclear weapon research. The United States doesn't like it. So the United States is making it cost money. Iran can't make money from trade. And so maybe they'll think about changing their nuclear weapons strategy. This is a very powerful diplomatic tool and it very does, it can change how governments operate. The problem is it does it by hurting the economy of a country and that always hurts the most vulnerable, okay? The government officials are never the ones that are gonna go hungry. The government officials are never the ones that are gonna be poor. You know, if you've got a country that's getting sanctions put on it, that's a government that's gonna keep themselves rich and, the, and who's gonna sacrifice the poor. So sanctions and trade embargo, it's very powerful, but it does it by causing pain to the most vulnerable in a country, never causing pain to the actual policy makers. And it's the vulnerable people, the old, the young, the civilians, that start getting hurt, and then they tell their government to change. It's uh, it's a problematic policy. The problem, you know, it's got some pluses and negatives. Problem is, it's a very powerful tool. Problem is, it hurts people. So one of the effects of the uh, blockade on German supplies was Germany was playing nice. They started the war with sinking every ship. Okay, that's called unrestricted submarine warfare. It's kind of not not a nice move uh, to sink every ship. And so they stopped. But once Germany was starving and they were desperate towards the end of the world war and they didn't like that policy that England was doing, blockading the food, they started it back up, the unrestricted submarine warfare. So some harsh blockades led to some harsh reaction. Neither side really wanted a long, grueling war though, so they both thought of ways to break the deadlock on the Western Front. Idea number one, new frontiers. When the war first broke out, Australia was quick to take German New Guinea. The Allies also quickly jumped on Germany's colonies in Africa. Okay, we're just going to sit here and we're going to see how it becomes a world war, okay? The colonies are going to get involved. And particularly in German East Africa, locals were enlisted as soldiers and carriers by both sides, leading to a tragic loss of life for the native Africans. Some new combatants entered the war as well. The Allies' new friends were Italy and Japan. Japan was busy building itself an empire, so it was more than happy to take away German islands and colonies in East Asia. This is important, um, important idea that'll go on to World War II. Japan is fully on imperialism. It started in the late 1800s, took over Korea. They want to take over, I mean, uh, close to anything they can in the Pacific, okay? So they're, they're looking. They're looking for, in their mind, China later. They've got Korea, they want islands. They, want, they got Southeast Asia areas, okay? So now put yourself in Japan's position. Japan has a choice. Which side do they go on? Okay, well, the U um, England is friends with France, which is kind of buddies mostly with the U.S. U.S. Isn't, U.S. isn't in the war yet, but we know the U.S. is with England and France and Russia. They're all they're all together. Those are the Europeans that in the U.S. Ha that have a lot of places here. And Germany. So which one is Japan going to attack? You don't attack the four countries. You attack the one country. By joining up with the four countries, Japan can attack German areas and quickly pick those off and then wait and later go on to some World War II aggression. Pick the lone one out, Germany. So Japan went on the side of the Allies. Oh, and Japan probably thought the Allies were going to win anyway, and you will always want to pick the victor. So if someone looked at this situation, the chances are England and France uh, with the help of the U.S. Um, um, trade, would win the war. So Japan is also probably just picking the victor. Italy actually had an alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary before the war. But after some tense relations, and then the Allies promising to give them some of Austria-Hungary's stuff, they switched sides. Um, Italy wanted land. Italy didn't uh, was defeated by Ethiopia. Italy didn't really have a lot of territory. Italy is a late country, okay? Germany is a late country. They joined in the mid 1800s. Italy is a very late country. They were split and then they joined in the mid 1800s. So Italy is really far behind in overseas colonies. So whoever, that's what Italy's working on. And if the allies promise them land, Italy's thinking that's probably a good thing. Italy opened up a front in the mountains here. But like everyone else, they were stuck in stalemate for most of the war. The Central Powers' new friend was a struggling empire in the Middle East. 
Okay, the Ottoman Empire uh, was known as the, quote, sick man of Europe. They were a struggling empire, a lot of internal resistance, having, having trouble uh, economically. Um, for getting into the war, it's best, it's best to say that they made a choice. They made a choice. Well, Britain, France, and Russia joined in on the fight. And for some reason, the Ottoman Empire. Canada, France, and Italy declared war on Germany. And then for some reason, Turkey joined Germany. And uh, we'll leave it at that. The Ottomans... Ottoman? The Ottoman were divided on whether to actually join the war or not. That's a traditional uh, Ottoman fez. Traditional uh, headgear. Since they had been exhausted by the recent Balkan Wars. Some of the politicians who did want to join went off on their own and fired some shells at Russia. And then came back and said, whoops, looks like we're at war now. The Ottoman entry into the war was of particular concern to the British, since the Middle East was full of oil, and Britain wanted all of that oil. First, the Ottoman... I mean, this is the, this is the heart of Middle Eastern oil. We're um, talking Persian Gulf right down here. It's where Kuwait is, and we get the Tigris and Euphrates River to Iraq. So we could just get all the oil fields right down by the Persian Gulf going into, uh, going into Iraq. And think about how important oil consumption is, okay? The 1900s, we are now getting everything is done by gas, you know, the cars and that sort of thing. The, the trains are going to go into diesel fuel. And, uh, and so we are switching over from steam to gas and gas needs oil. It is now the lifeblood energy of the world. Very important part of the world coming up right there, uh, the Middle Eastern oil fields. Ottomans tried to attack Russia in the Caucasus Mountains, but they weren't prepared for the cold, and many of them froze to death. Okay, do we even need to go into uh, the cold of Russia? This is yet another example of the Russian winter, uh, affectionately, well, not by invading armies, known as General Winter. Okay, I mean, you get it every winter, and it has the same battle plan. Incredibly cold, uh, lack of food, freezing, deep snow, uh, unbelievably devastating to armies. I mean, we can go back to every major army that is really trying to invade Russia. Just It just doesn't work. Napoleon's first army was devastated to the tune of, I want to say, 300,000 of Napoleon's troops. We get this example here, and we're going to get it in World War II also. Troops from the Asian front are sent to reinforce his lines, troops that are trained in winter warfare. Stalin now gets the break he needs. The full force of Russian winter stops the Germans in their tracks. His forces are overextended, and his troops weakened by the bitter cold of winter. Within months, the Germans are forced to retreat. Moscow is saved. By now, by now, we should everyone learn a lesson. Do not, do not invade Russia in the winter. Then they crossed miles of desert to take the Suez Canal from the British. Okay, this is going to go through World War II, so you can put this in your brain right now. British has got the Suez Canal. So British controls Egypt. They did in World War I, they did in World War II. And the Suez Canal is an incredibly important water route um, that, you know, that connects. And in World War II, we're we are definitely not going to go into this in World War II, but might as well mention it now. There's an in entire um, tank desert campaigns of the Italians and the, the Germans trying to get Egypt and the Suez Canal away from England. And uh, 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 Rommel, the desert fox, they called him, uh, the German tank commander, not succeeding. England held on to Egypt and the Suez Canal through both world wars, vital for transporting, um, transporting resources from the Mediterranean across. But that failed too. Then the Allies tried to take the Dardanelles at Gallipoli in a long and hard trench warfare campaign, but that also failed. The Ottomans blamed their initial losses on the ethnic Armenians living within Ottoman territory, and the resulting Armenian genocide led to the deaths of one and a half million people. Okay, I'd like to take a second um, to talk about the Armenian genocide. I, I have a little moral problem. I mean, I get it. It's, you know, we simplify things oversimplify things sometimes, at least we're honest about that, in order to quickly get that at people. But I, I, I feel bad, and I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I feel bad when you put a genocide into just one sentence. You need to, you need to touch the topic 
with a little more gentleness and you need to give the topic a little bit more respect that it deserves. So, you, so I applaud anyone for definitely just knowing that there was a World War I genocide is better than most people in the world know, okay? That's good, that's good. And now that we know that, we have to deal with it with a little more, um, give it more time it deserves, because it's a very, it's a serious topic, and up there with one of the worst things that's happened in the um, 20th century. Um, so what we have is the rulers of the Ottoman Empire were the Muslim Turks, a, reli a religion and an ethnicity. In the Ottoman Empire, there was a forced minority, forced to be there in part of the empire, um, Armenian Christians, uh, ethnicity, religion. Okay, For years before World War I, it's not as simple as they were blamed for the war, although that was an excuse. But for years before World War I, there was prejudice and persecution for years. World War I is just uh, the cover. War and conflict is often used as a shield or a cover for an atrocity because the rest of the world has something else to be worried about. The attention is shifted, and as the attention is shifted, this is happening too. That is literally what happened during the Holocaust in World War II. All the attention was shifted to the war. While the war is going on, concurrently is a genocide. And yet it's almost, almost impossible to address a genocide when a war is going on at the same time. And what it was, was a forced relocation of the Armenians from where they were living, at least thousands of miles away. And it was a forced relocation. And you could call it a death march. There's no real difference between the other death marches in history and this as a death march. Millions of Armenians died as they were being relocated. Uh, killed, some died, and others were killed. Others were violated horribly on the move. And then uh, on the move and at the destination, because the destination where they were moved forcibly to was inhospitable. Children were separated from their families, and it's a large, large genocide. Many of the Armenians emigrated, left, and the orphans that their parents died um, emigrated, and they many moved to the capital district of New York State. One of the uh, largest destinations was in the United States, New York, in the capital district around the city of Albany. Um, it is entirely possible that because of this genocide, that Hitler felt emboldened because Turkey, quote, got away with the action. Um, there's enough sources that this is a mostly probable that it's actually a true quote. Hitler was, Adolf Hitler was talking about killing people in Poland to make more room for the Germans to live kind of similar, which what was going on in the stated things in uh, the Ottoman Empire, move the Armenians out and have more room to live. And it's said that Hitler spoke the words, who after all speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? Meaning, just 20, uh, 20 years later, just 20 years later, no one's talking about how Turkey had 1.5 million Armenians killed. So it's impossible that he thought if Turkey could get, quote, get away with it, so could he. Today, Turkey admits that it was bad. The country, the government admits that it was bad, but won't admit it's a genocide, purposefully killing part of the people because of uh, ethnicity or religion. And today, the U.S. government won't officially call it a genocide, even though political candidates for president, even though many political candidates promise they will call it a genocide, once they get into office, they realize... If the United States actually uses that word, there's going to be international trouble with Turkey, who happens to be a sort of a friend of the United States today. All these new frontiers hadn't done much to change the war. Aware that the Allies had more men and supplies than them, the Germans knew they had to do something to break the stalemate. Before the war, there was a big conference that set out the rules of modern warfare. No chemical weapons, no killing civilians. Basically, don't be jerks. So there had been um, a push before World War I, starting in the 1800s, uh, for the Europeans to come up with basically rules of war. To I don't want to say to make war more civilized, but uh, to progress, to progress war to something that uh, is a little more orderly and causes less suffering. Um, and so a lot of people say, "What? Well, wait, there's rules for war?" Well, yeah. Um, 
it comes from the idea that war doesn't mean you're trying to ultimately destroy the other person. Or mostly, war is because the, the governments decide to go to war. They're going to war for a specific purpose. It's going to end quickly and it's going to move on. And it is, it is recognized that the vast, and I mean vast majority of everybody in the country has no vote on the war. Okay. And many people in countries don't want the war. They are literally innocent in whether there's a war or not. So if, if war is a political tool, which it was at the time, and it was given that war was unavoidable, humans, there is no way that humans have figured out how to avoid war. It just hasn't happened ever. So they knew war was a political tool. War is unavoidable. Well, shouldn't then countries minimize the suffering of a war? Like, if you know you're going to have it, and, in fact, some people liked to use it. I've tired myself out for three years to make this conflict possible. This merely dots the I's and crosses the T's. Shouldn't you do all you can to min minimize the suffering? And, quite frankly, even if you're going to be very cynical, let's say you absolutely hate the other country. Well, from a very cynical way of looking at it, think about it. If you violate the rules, then they will violate the rules also, and then that would make your soldiers suffer. So I don't know, I think the, the three words you might want to put in your mind, there's the Geneva Convention, the Hague Convention, and uh, the Red Cross is sort of part of this too. The Red Cross deals is a neutral group, deals with rules of wounded soldiers, they're not part of the war. Uh, there's many different Geneva Conventions, some dealing with uh, battlefield wounded, others dealing with prisoners. And there's a, a couple Hague conventions. What, the Hague is a place. They come together, make rules of war. Geneva is a place, a city. Come together, make rules of war. Uh, believe it or not, it's not that easy to find a nice little list of the rules on the that were covered by the Hague conventions. This is the best I can do with a little bit of looking. Things like uh, treat your prisoners humanely. You could put them in camps, but not cells. Uh, you, you could work the prisoners, but not, not hard. Don't work them hard. This one was interesting. If a prisoner escapes and they rejoin their army, and then you recapture them, you can't punish them for escaping in the first place. But if they escape and you capture them, you can punish them a little bit, have some discipline. But if they, it's kind of like, if they make it, they win, and it's a do-over, and then they start. Uh, this is where the, the term name, rank, and serial number is all you're going to get from me. Name, rank, and serial number. That's actually in the Hague Convention. Prisoners have to give their name and the rank, and if they don't give their name and the rank, they're not, they don't get the protections. Uh, freedom of prisoners, religion, no... Then battlefield stuff, no poisoning, no killing or wounding the surrendered, no weapons that cause unnecessary suffering, don't attack undefended towns, seems kind of good. And if you are attacking a defended town, uh, give them a warning before you're going to bomb them, so then uh, the innocents can get away. And when you do bomb them, you really have to try to avoid bombing churches, hospitals, and historic buildings, and such like that. Yeah. The Germans held a meeting and decided to be jerks. Zeppelin air raids commenced over British cities. They also started attacking the Allied trenches with chlorine gas, and they used submarines to sink civilian ships. One such civilian ship was the Lusitania, which had 159 Americans on board when it was sunk, further swaying US opinion against the Germans. Not to be completely unfair to the Germans, the Allies also engaged in chemical warfare soon after, and they had been hiding anti-submarine weapons on their civilian ships, which let the Germans justify their attacks. All right, this is where people get really confused. Um, so let's try not to get confused. The sinking of the Lusitania, which uh, uh, had the Americans on, did not bring the U.S. into the war. Let's take a look at the U.S. involvement really quickly. The U.S. was neutral and sold supplies. Like literally, why is the United States going to go to war and when this is a war of kings, a, 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 a silly war in Europe that doesn't involve the U.S. at all, why would we, why would the U.S. ever do that? especially when the U.S. could remain neutral and sell supplies. But unrestricted submarine warfare was pretty bad because U.S. ships were getting sunk and U.S. people were getting sunk, like on the Lusitania. So in the end, Germany, or in the middle of the war, Germany stopped sub-warfare because the U.S. said, stop it, man, stop it. Germany stopped their unrestricted sub-warfare. So the Lusitania did not lead to the U.S. getting involved. Okay, that some people believe it did. It didn't. Now, towards the end of the war, yes, Germany started unrestricted sub-warfare again because they were desperate, and Germany tried to collude with Mexico against the United States, and that pushed the U.S. over. So the U.S. said, that's it. You actually are being an aggressor here, Germany. We're going to war. Okay, but it wasn't the Lusitania. 
It's 1916, and a lot is happening. As if they didn't have enough enemies already, Germany added one more to the list. Portugal had been getting a bit chummy with the Allies behind the scenes, and Germany didn't like that one bit. Around the same time, I know nothing about Portugal's involvement in World War I. That sounds like a fantastic thing to research. Notice Spain remains neutral. Spain will remain neutral all of World War I and all of World War II. Uh, Switzerland is also going to remain neutral too. So those are two little, um, I guess you would call them victories for Switzerland and Spain. Uh, they managed to avoid the two most deadly wars in all of uh, human history, and they are like sitting right there. The only sea battle of the war happened. Both sides had a new powerful class of battleships called dreadnoughts, but they were so expensive to build that neither side wanted to risk losing them in a battle, so they kept them in port, except for one time when they had a big fight and a bunch of them got damaged, so they didn't try that again. The UK started conscripting men to the army, so they had plenty of reserves, which is just as well because the Western Front was about to get brutal. Well, so that conscript, that word conscript means the draft, okay? Conscripting means the draft. Germans launched an attack around the French city of Verdun. The French defended it desperately, leading to hundreds of thousands of casualties. Under pressure, the French called on its allies to do something to draw the Germans' attention away. Why do I think the bloody va battle of Verdun? It must have been, I know it's in the top fives, but that term, bloody va battle of Verdun? People use that adjective with Verdun, bloody. I don't know where. Wait, so the British started their own long and brutal fight, the Battle of the Somme, with 60,000 British casualties on just the first day. It was also here that the British first used one crazy brand new piece of sci-fi technology. The Russians had been getting pushed back further and further into their own territory. Oh, that's it for the tank? Uh, the, the, the tanks were in later in the war, but they, they were, they were the, I, I don't like the term, game changer. They were the trench killers. The tanks were really, the tanks and fresh United States troops are what pushed the tide and made the Allies win. So do not underestimate the power of that technology tank to win it for the Allies and only the French and the uh, uh, English. The English had made it and the French had that technology too. And uh, yeah, tanks, they, they're more important than that sentence just mentioned. New offensive was launched from the south with all out desert warfare. The offensive was aided by one famous British officer, better known as Lawrence of Arabia, who helped lead the Arab tribes in a revolt that wreaked havoc on the Ottoman supply line. Well, of course, Blanche, they did it in that movie. What movie? Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> by the time 1917 rolled around, everyone was exhausted. There were mutinies in the French army, the German populace was starving, and the war had drained all of Russia's supplies. There is Whoa, go back. Replay. And the war had drained all of Russia's supplies. That is super important. Okay, so we are going to see the Russian Revolution. The people are going to revolt, kick out the, the uh, Tsar, and eventually Russia is going to go communist. USSR. And it's all because of that. Russia was drained. Their food was at minimum. Their weapons were at minimum. Their morale, their willingness to stay in the war was at a minimum. This allowed the revolution to happen. If it wasn't for World War I, no Russian revolution and then no communist revolution. This is a big deal in world history. There is no clear winner and it was still anyone's war. The only question now was, who was going to break first? And the answer was Russia. Exactly. Tired of not eating and mad that a crazy magic homeless guy was calling some of the shots, there was Yes, if you want, if you find history interesting, you can look up this story, okay? Rasputin in, um, uh, during World War I, right? The fascinating story, okay? So you can look this up. I won't spoil it to, you know what? I'm not going to spoil it. And then there's an assassination. Almost. But yes, but not quite. But yes. Fascinating story. The homeless guy was calling some of the shots. There was an uprising in Petrograd complete with riots and strikes. The riots turned into a full-scale revolution and a new government overthrew the Tsar. Okay, we don't get too much into this because this is the Russian Revolution, okay? But it is important to notice this because it is fascinating war strategy, okay? We have a, Ru we, let's just say a Russian Revolution one, where the people just kicked out the Tsar, the monarch. The people are now ruling. They have elections. Look, freedom. Actual freedom. They have elections. They have voting. It was a bye-bye king rule. But the new government didn't do one thing. The new government didn't get out of the war. 
And that's what the people really wanted. So the actual people are still angry. They're still starving. They don't have uh, fuel for the winter. They're freezing. They're starving. There's just a revolution and they're still in the war. So what happens? Then a few months later, the Bolsheviks overthrew the new government and they pulled Russia out of the war. Of course, the people still wanted to be out of the war. And so later, the Bolsheviks over the term is Bolshevik, which means communist. This is uh, Lenin. OK. And so just a couple months after the first revolution, the communists in Russia said, hey, you people are still starving. Let's go communist and promised peace, land, bread. What does that mean? Peace. The communists promised to get out of the war. Land. People can get their own little land to farm. And bread. They were starving. The communists are going to be there. What is the crazy, couldn't even write it into a movie thing? Lenin was in exile. Lenin wasn't even in Russia. I think he was in Switzerland. And so the king of Germany paid for a train, paid for a train to bring Lenin and 32 of his communist friends, I think, back into Russia in the hopes that he would do a communist revolution. And he did. Like, what kind of war strategy is that? The Germans are like, okay, let's just send this one communist in and see if he takes down the whole darn country. <laughs> Lenin was exiled before the war because he was doing his communist stuff. And then you, you, you got to, it's crazy, right? The Germans sitting around going, I know, let's bring Lenin back and he'll just take down the whole darn thing. He did. You can't write that stuff in a movie. It worked. Lenin got back and within a couple months, he overthrew the new government and they pulled him out of the war through the new government, and they pulled Russia out of the war. This was great news for Germany, who now only had to focus on the Western Front. But there was still one problem. The pesky United States of America was looking increasingly like it was going to join the war. America had been selling supplies to the Allies throughout the war, and was getting super rich off the back of it, meaning it was in fantastic shape and was dangerous to the Germans. That is true. The US was getting better and better and bigger and stronger. So Germany sent a telegram to Mexico saying, wouldn't it be crazy cool if you guys attacked America? But the British intercepted the message, showed it to the Americans, and that was the final straw. Okay. Crazy cool if you guys attacked America? Okay. No. Well, first off, it's called the Zimmerman telegram. Okay, so we want, we want, to, know that, we want to know that word. It's important for World War I. So Zimmerman telegram. And... Wouldn't it be cool if you guys attacked America? It was much more subtle, okay? It was, hey, Mexico, if America joins the war, if they join the war on the side of the Allies, why don't you join on the side of us, the Germans? And when we win, you could get back places like Texas and stuff like that, okay? There was a big, if the U.S. gets involved, we want to be you, we want you on our side, okay? That's different than saying, attack America, but the British intercepted the message, showed it to the Americans, and that was the final straw. Wouldn't it be cool if the British actually faked that telegram just to get the U.S. into the war? Because that sounds like, that sounds, no. Uh, that would be a conspiracy theory. Basically, the German who wrote the telegram came out later and said, yeah, I wrote it. It was real. I guess they didn't think it was that bad because they wanted the U.S. to stay neutral. It wasn't about attacking the U.S. And the reason they thought, the reason Germany thought, that the U.S. was going to come back into the, or come into the war was Germany was going to start unrestricted submarine warfare again. And they thought that that might bring the U.S. in. Well, the unrestricted, the unrestricted submarine warfare two plus the telegram brought the U.S. in. American troops began shipping out to Europe. This was terrible news for Germany, and they knew their only hope now was to force France and the UK to surrender before the fresh American troops arrived. It was now or never, so they started one final attack. They converged their troops and hit hard at the Somme and pushed the Allies back. They hit a second time for the north, and then again and again. With each hit, the Germans were spending more and more resources, while the Allies were getting better and better at repelling their attacks. Some of these battles are uh, double. You have them in the beginning of the war, and then you have a battle in the same area at the end because the trenches didn't move that far. By the fifth punch, the Allies held the line and even pushed back. With American troops now arriving in larger numbers, the Allies launched a counterattack, and that was it. The Central Powers were being pushed back on all fronts. Bulgaria collapsed first, followed by the Ottoman Empire. 
Then Austria-Hungary, and finally on November 11th, 1918, at 11 o'clock, Germany surrendered. Okay, so, um, you know, we got the Ottoman surrendering, but I believe Austria and Germany actually ended because of revolutions, okay? The people just got fed up. In Germany, the uh, soldiers mutinied, I believe, and there was like a mini-type revolution. And in Austria-Hungary, there's a revolution. So it's basically these wars literally ended just like, just like content creator said in the beginning. It was just going to, everyone's just going to get worn down. And so the actual people rose up and said no more. Powers were being pushed back on all fronts. Bulgaria collapsed first, followed by the Ottoman Empire, then Austria-Hungary, and finally on November 11th, 1918, at 11 o'clock, Germany surrendered. Armistice Day. Armistice, the uh, ending of fighting. The 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 11, 11, 11, Germany surrendered. Armistice Day. Today, quite frankly, there's been so many wars, unfortunately, after World War I, that the United States celebrates, changed from Armistice Day, which is the ending of World War I, November 11th, to Veterans Day. And unfortunately, because there's been so many wars, including World War II, uh, been so many wars since World War I that we had to change it to Veterans Day. At the peace treaty, Germany was forced to reduce its military, accept war guilt, and pay the bill for the war. Um, this is big point right here. The Treaty of Versailles in Versailles, Paris. Germany took total blame, and this treaty basically punished Germany so much that it set the stage and made it made Germany hurt so much and be so angry that Adolf Hitler was able to take that anger and rise to it was one of the big reasons Adolf Hitler was able to rise to power and once he was in power almost 10 years later starts World War II that's why we say this Treaty of Versailles punishing Germany so much happens to be one of the major causes of World War II. After indescribable suffering and millions dead, the world learned its lesson and never had such an awful war again. For about 20 years. Not bad, not bad at all. Um, sure, I'm going to miss some things here, but what would I have included? Um, I would have found a way to put things uh, where the countries went to total war, and the countries shifted to what we call a war footing and did total war, and that's where the home life during these wars really changed, unlike other wars, okay? There was propaganda, women moved into non-traditional jobs, there was the conscription, the draft, there was rationing, there was government control, Serious, serious, serious changes to society uh, worthy of talking about. Uh, I'd also mention that Germany really tried to keep the U.S. out of the war. Germany really didn't want the U.S. in the war. You know, Germany even took out newspaper ads to, like, warn the U.S. people, like, don't go on boats. We're doing unrestricted submarine warfare. It's like, literally, don't go on these cruise ships. We are sinking them. <laughs> don't try to sell stuff. We're sinking boats. Stay off the water. So Germany really tried to keep the U.S. out of the war. Some interesting um, follow-ups that would not have fit in this, but hey, let's talk about them. Um, after the war, the USSR was punished for two things. One, they were communist, and basically there was no other country that liked the communists. The communists had been around since the 1800s, and nobody liked them as a political movement. So the USSR was punished after the war, and they were punished for surrendering. Even though they were on the winning side, they left early. Now, Japan and Italy were also on the winning side, but they were eventually not rewarded with a lot of land. Well, that could very well mean that Japan and Italy wanted more land, and guess what they did a few years later? They joined with Germany in World War II to try to get more land. Women's rights movements uh, led to the right to vote in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and others right during and right after the war. It's like, boom, right there. And you better believe that the war and um, and the responsibility that the women took on at home during the war, you better believe that had a big deal with the rights movement saying it's time for voting, suffrage. And uh, an interesting question I'll pose to you, and there is an answer out there. There's a, a book or two on this. People studied it. If the number of men and women are roughly equal normally, 
And then let's say you have a world war, like World War I, and it kills and severely wounds mostly men. What's the effect? So if you're, if you're the United Kingdom, and all of a sudden million, let's say, let's say a million men die, and uh, another million are wounded, I don't know, numbers are similar to that, severely wounded, what effects that going to have on your society? I'll, I'll just leave that up as a question, because it certainly did, and people, it's totally interesting to go and research. Should I give you, okay, here you go. There's a book and some research called Singled Out. The surplus two million. Singled out the surplus two million. You could go read a little bit about it on online. Fascinating stuff. All right, that's a wrap. Thanks for watching.